Uh, are we ready? You are recorded. Recorded. All right, welcome to the, the design summit. So we were going to be first this morning, so I had this whole thing set up to like welcome everybody. We're not first anymore. Well, we pushed out. Yeah, we've been pushed out. So this is us. Um, I'm Greg Bloomquist. Uh, that's, that's, just like. <laughs> that's my handle pretty much everywhere. So um, GitHub, Gmail, all the places. Facebook. Okay. Yeah, I'm Jason Fry. I spoke earlier. I'm Fry Guy 9 on some places and Fry Guy in other places. Uh, so, but the picture is always the same. So I've been with Red Hat uh, about eight years, nine years, something like that, um, before the acquisition of Manage IQ. Um, after the, Mac the acquisition, I joined the team, um, spent about two years coming up to speed, learning things. And now I'm the uh, team lead on provider things, so all things providers. And Jason is a person. Um, yeah. Um, I've been mainly been focusing on um, architecture, so that's why I was in the original talks about like the vision. Um, but I did a lot of the original EMS refresh stuff, the original design around that, and um, kind of been shoveling it over to Greg <laughs> and working together with him to figure out this whole provider driver thing we're going to talk about. There we go. So that's that, yeah, that's what we're going to talk about, provider drivers. So in the system, we've always called them external management systems, but I think in the out in the wild, they've been known as providers. Um, and when we talk about something like provide or drivers, we're talking about how do we make these things plug in. So you saw the presentation this morning, the sockets and the plugs and all the things. Um, this is kind of what we're what we want to do. And we also heard a lot about this morning about how hard it is to do it. We're going to talk a little bit about why it's so hard. This is the problem. Everyone, just, everyone has seen spaghetti code, right? No special sauce. No special sauce. We have no sauce. No, um, it's a lot of spaghetti. We heard, about, we heard about it this morning. There's lots of things entangled together. Um, but it's eight years old. I mean, the application has been around for a long time. And it hasn't been, you know, rewritten at any point in time. It's just been reacted. So every time a new customer comes up, says, I need a new feature, a new little strand of spaghetti gets through there. It has grown organically. It's organic spaghetti. I'm going to talk about some numbers. 414 is a number of lines of OpenStack code that does not live in a file called OpenStack and does not live under a directory called OpenStack. So these are just hidden pieces of OpenStack functionality throughout our system. 1,800 lines of code, almost 1,900 lines of code, live under directories called OpenStack. So these are things that are nicely tucked away somewhere. Some nicely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's as good as it could be for now. 2,900 lines of code are in files called OpenStack, but not under directories called OpenStack. So these are like VM OpenStack. So that's a model that we encase some functionality to control OpenStack VMs. It lives in our Rails model location, so it has you know, understanding of how to talk to the database. But it's also kind of, it's living right alongside VM, VM, or, uh, yeah, VM, VMware and VM Amazon. So these provider specific things are living side by side in a lot of places. So we put it all together, 5,200 lines of code to support OpenStack. So I was going to extrapolate this out to say we currently have five providers. Right? We, can, can anybody name them? <laughs> VMware. VMware. What was the price? What was it? What was the price for naming them all? You get zero. <laughs> what's the price or what's the price? <laughs> so, prior to Rev, there's SCVMM now. OpenStack. It's OpenStack. Amazon. It's Amazon. Amazon. And there's some other hidden stuff. And there's, there's, <laughs> and there's, there's, there's some secret. Room. That's the secret sauce. If we multiply this by five, 26,000 or something like that, but Jason told me, no, 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 you can't do that. Of course not. Because VMware, is more like 10 times that. So I'm going to show you 
the extrapolated number, 26,000, more like 70,000. So there's 70,000 lines of code to support providers in our application. Well, that's still less than the application for the ones. <laughs> that's probably true. <laughs> that's probably true. And, <laughs> yeah. So let's fix application controller. Um, Jason's going to talk about the solution. You want this? Yeah. I'm going to use it. I'll take it. cheese. Mm -hmm. More tomatoes. All the work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So you saw the big pile of spaghetti. So what can we do about it? Um, so one of the things that uh, we've talked about, this whole plug-in architecture, that's great. That's the long-term vision. That's where we want to get to. The first step is really figure out, just organize ourselves a little bit better. So for phase one, what we're looking into is just kind of putting spaghetti in pots. You know, have a VMware pot, have a Rev pot, have an Oracle pot. Put it all, get it all into some location that we can get to. Um, and this is going to require a lot of refactoring. Um, yeah, wait till the door. <laughs> um, she left. Oh, she just left? Okay. Push it, push it open. And then let the code to take the closed door. So, this is going to require some refactoring, obviously. Um, and the ultimate direction we want to go is with plugins. Um, how do we get there? So there's a lot of components that make up each provider. We have uh, the event system, metrics, um, connection and authentication, inventory, operations. Uh, there's actually some more in here. There's things like uh, an interface to fleecing. Uh, so how do I get the bits to actually do fleecing? Um, and the thought is we can take all these pieces and for each plugin, essentially, figure out what those components are. Um, so this slide really is meant to show that some of the pieces are a little easier to do than others. Uh, con connection and authentication, operation and inventory, they all kind of look the same because the code's kind of structured already that way. It's just a matter of taking those bits and moving them over. Some things like uh, events are turned on their head. Um, the event collectors, for example, are written um, type first, and then there's event collection stuff underneath that hooks in backwards. Um, for metrics, it's really weird because we were so VMware focused at the beginning that um, the database tables, all the columns, even things like the interval um, is all VMware uh, centric. And then we took the other guys like OpenStack and Rev and jammed them into the VMware bucket. Um, so fixing that might be a little tricky. Um, this is where we want to get to. Each bucket, um, essentially like a directory, if you will, uh, for phase one, would have a subdirectory for connections, inventory, operations, and all the code to support that specific feature uh, would live in that directory. Yes? The first thing that strikes me when I see this is that there could be commonality for some of the things below each provider. Sure. Uh, so OpenStack's connection could act like Azure's connection. So wouldn't it make more sense to turn that over so it's connections with the providers under it? Potentially. Um, but if you look at a pluggability perspective, these can actually be split out into separate repos. If you did it that way, you have the connections repo with five different things in it. Then you have the event repo with five different things in it. Makes it tough to figure out what belongs where. And you could have a connections repo that could be five different things and one could be common for all providers? Or no, I'm saying it? don't do that. <laughs> I'm saying that makes it difficult for people to add a new provider, right? Because they would have to go to 15 different repos and say, okay, I gotta add an event piece, I gotta add this. This way flips it over ah, yeah, good, good and says, point. I just need to add a brand new thing. What are the things that I need to support? I need Perfect. to have a way to manage connections, inventory. People are going to add providers. That's kind everything of you need to do to add a provider. Right. That's the big question. How do I add a provider? And the answer is like a two week long conversation. And then it's another two week long conversation after they realize that theirs is a little different. And then it's six, <laughs> good, it's six months of implementation. Right, right. Then it's six months of implementation. So, so when you have layers of organization that kind of conflict or overlay on the Rails model has models directory, mm -hmm. and then you want a subclass of, so you'll say, VMware VM, mm -hmm. which is a model, but it's mm -hmm. VMware specific. Right. Does it live under models? Does it live under model slash VMware? So one of the, so I'll get to that, sort of, um, right there. Uh, <laughs> um, 
Essentially, right now, this is a big phase one thought because that two week conversation and the six month implementation is our huge hurdle right now. So just kind of putting things in buckets is an easy way to say to somebody, look, this is how we did VMware and here it all is in one place. If you can model yourselves after that or after Red or OpenStack or whatever, um, you can kind of get there. Um, ultimately, Manage IQ would, prevent, would present a core API that these things could talk into. So um, perhaps shared stuff might live in the core API, right? A shared common connection thing. Um, an event catcher model of polling and an event catcher model for callbacks, right? Just create generic models and you kind of plug your stuff into it, right? The basic loop kind of structure. Um, that could be provided by the core or a, or a separate core library like provider core or something like that. Uh, and OpenStack would, uh, each bucket would kind of talk with those bits and pieces. As far as models go, um, one of the things we talked about is maybe leveraging Rails engines, maybe in a phase two, mm -hmm. where a provider could say, well, here's my model for the Rails side of things, uh, and it derives from wherever, and when it gets popped into the Rails engine, it, that kind of all falls into place. Yeah, and the other nice thing about that is it also factors out migrations and... Exactly, kind of yeah. Other. Yeah, that, uh, the migration mm -hmm. stuff all end up being part of the core, right, because that's what the base database, like the VM's table would still be there, and these would just create subclasses on yeah, top of But if of it's that. truly a Rails model, they would have the option of adding their own tables. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, if they needed brand new tables we never thought of before, that could be done potentially. So, so just to look at and step back and see a bigger picture. I mean, this morning you talked about plugging in, plugging in capabilities, or right. chunks, and so now you could have those could be implemented as Rails models, mm -hmm. and then you could have providers within them that could be their own Rails models as well. So Essentially, yeah, that that might be the long-term goal. Um, I think we have to see how it evolves, um, and the really the I keep going back to this. The first step is just organizing. It's such a mess, and if we don't organize, we can't even get to that point. We don't even know what we have for a lot of these things, and we don't know where the gaps are right now. And I think that's a big trick, big problem that we have is we know that VMware provides X Y Z functionality. We can't remember where it is, and we don't know how to implement an open stack because we can't find it in VMware. <laughs> you know, it's like hundred thousand lines of code trying to look through and find this stuff. It's it's tough. Um, that's it, I guess. Any other questions on this part? So, Jason kind of covered a lot of this. So I'm going to go through quickly. This is a nice set of sweet and pretty recipe in the back, if you ever want to. Um, the spaghetti? Yeah, spaghetti covered arm. Um, so, initial pass, this is what we just talked about. Create some kind of separate directory structure, start moving things around, um, move all the back end code. Avoid UI changes for now. So. I mean, we already talked about in the beginning, or just just the, the previous, um, or two previous um, presentation where it said, you know, where Dan and all the other guys presented about how they're gonna restructure a lot of the, the UI code. Um, there's, there's a lot of work to be done on the UI side, and trying to surgically remove a lot of the provider code from it will be really hard, I think, at the same time. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Brandon. No one's sitting in the center of the room. I still think you're back into the UI code. No. Yeah, it's reacting to the UI code. Yeah, even the chandelier is afraid of UI. Um, there are a lot of UI challenges, though. Um, you know that we've talked about. Um, but even far down to the littlest thing, like what's the icon for VMware versus the icon yeah. for OpenStack, right? And, and all of that should ultimately be in the provider plugin. But that could, that, when we talk about you know Rails engines, maybe that's a way to do it. Where you say in my in my Rails engine, I say this is what a provider icon looks like. So when you show my type of provider page, you show this icon, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe that would work. We're not entirely sure yet. Well, I just want to chime up. Uh, a Rails engine is just a gem like any other block of code. The difference is, surprise, surprise, they have conventions on where you stick the tasks. So right now we type a rake task in the command line. That code doesn't exist anywhere. If we do rake db migrate, that doesn't exist anywhere in our code base. But because the gem was built in a certain way, we knew how to actually run that task um, and provide for the gem. An engine, all it does is says, in addition to just providing the great tasks and code, it says, oh, here, if you wanted to add a controller, this is where you would put it. 
you wanted to add a migration, this is where you would put it. A model. A, a model. Yeah, definitely an active record model. And so I think engines, people, uh, I don't know, they're a little intimidating. Oh my gosh, this whole engine thing. At the end of the day, it's just a gem, but just like on a Rails app, we have an apps directory or something like that. This just is a gem that happens to have a similar structure. So it's really, it's approachable, and it's also the structure we already know from Rails. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it's yeah. also the namespace and pluggable gems. So yeah, and you don't it's have nice, to. but you get namespace isolation. Well, you don't get that for free. You had to actually. You have to generate the engine as a, as a pluggable. I mean, you could do a bad job and not put it in the namespace. <laughs> I don't advise it, right? But, uh, I mean, so at least, yeah, you but have that's the, a benefit. You get tables, you get models that you could set a storage, but the storage has namespace. Now, we could add namespacing without doing it as a model if we want to slowly as an engine. To, I think it, as an engine. Depends. Um, you know, I think the other... I, I mean, in our organization. I'm really getting into this next, but some of the other things that really have to be teased out is in our existing models, even for VMware, um, there's a lot of stuff that's baked in there that needs to be teased apart. So the model knows, the model itself is very, the Rails model, which is meant for database persistence, knows intimately how to talk to VMware to turn off a VM. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't happen, right? There should be some VM operation, VM VMware operations class or something and you say start or stop this thing for me, and then the Rails model, maybe it has a start method that thinly knows how to talk to its corresponding provider and pass that off along with the <laughs> ideal and, and some of that has been done for other providers. So like OpenStack and Amazon and maybe some others have, they have separate, separate code outside of the model that says this is how I stop, a, stop and start a, a, an OpenStack VM, but some of that VMware code is still kind of interwoven in there. Mm -hmm. The reasoning behind some of the MIQ VM work, mm -hmm. where you know, a lot of it is leasing based, but a lot of it is operations based. Right. Ideally, because that's strictly a live thing. Mm -hmm. Ideally, if you were to subclass that, and then have the types of VM models instantiated in like my VM thing, right. you know, say start whatever through that, right. that would make it clear. Right, and I think that's where, again, step one, organize the code. Step two, when we start building that manage IQ core API, that's where we're going to have to start talking about, well, how do we want to do those things? You know, what method should we expose that these providers say, you know, hook their method, or do they say, uh, you know, do they give a method or do they call into something else? Like, which direction does the data flow? Um, that's going to be a phase two kind of design thing, but that's where we want to get to eventually. Yeah. So this is just a quick screenshot of what the directory structure might look like. Um, We've been already talking about future phases, but we don't really know what it looks like yet. Um, some ideas we've been talking about, these... It looks like Jason's head. <laughs> we're going to put Jason's head in the application. No, um, so there's going to be APIs, or we're, we're talking about how, to, how we make these different APIs for things like refresh and events and metrics, whereas right now it's all very you know, pulled together in different areas. Um, how do you... How do you take the concept of EMS refresh, split it in half, and say some of this cares a lot about our database and its structure, and some of this cares a lot about the provider and its data. So how do you start pulling all that stuff apart and say, create an API layer that says, when I'm doing a refresh and collecting all this data, I can pull it all together, and we do this with VMware today. We have, we have a broker where it pulls all the data, holds it all in memory, and if anything changes, it can do little micro updates in that hash. If the whole thing changes, it can update the entire hash. And at some point in time, it can take that hash and dump it to our database. So we have notions of this existing throughout the code. We just need to standardize on one thing and say, this is, what, this is how you do it. Because like right now, OpenStack does it differently from that. It does not have a broker concept. Um, we just, every time we do a full refresh, we go out and we get the whole hash of all the data, and we shove it into the database. Um, so same thing, kind of the same idea exists with events. Right now, every single provider has a different way to grab events. We have a pretty standard way to say, once I have an event, hand this off to some other thing that knows how to, we I mean, really just save it in the database and maybe maybe examine the event a little bit and raise another event in our system or do something like that. So we have that idea. So maybe it's just a matter of slicing it somewhere and say, that lives on the provider side, 
and that lives on the core side. Um, same idea with metrics. We, you know, we keep on drilling into these things and saying, there's a, there's a place to slice this somewhere. We just gotta find out where it is. So you also see, you mentioned about how we kind of coerce everything to be common currently. Like, yeah. You know, keep, so metrics is possibly the worst. Right, metrics mm -hmm. is the thing that comes to mind. So ultimately, in the ongoing phases where providers could have their own tables, would you see possibly provider specific metrics tables given that the types of metrics provided by a provider can vary drastically? Yeah, well, okay, so that also today we say every data point has to be, has to uh, adhere to this 20 second period. So at every data point we get it because that's the way VMware does it, because VMware says every data point happens every 20 seconds. We take everybody else's data, OpenStack and everybody else, and we slice it up, we, we do this distribution across however much time their period is to create 20 second data points, and then we smooth that out over some area. So we may lose some, some spikes here and there because we're kind of smoothing things out, and we do that just to make sure that we're looking like VMware for those things. Um, yeah, ultimately, I think we want to get away from that. Um, so that I would expect yeah. that the API that we design would take that into account ahead of time. And then, the, you know, if we have to do that slicing or flattening initially, maybe that's done behind the API instead of having the provider to deal with that. Because that, that's really not their job. Or if you just say each provider does, collects their metrics in the provider specific way that's best for them. It could be. Um, the problem with that then becomes present presentation. Reporting. Right. Um, you know, I, I know Keenan has some ideas where he doesn't even want to use the database, right? He wants to use a completely different He's engine. About that. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> you keep um, signing other stuff to me. <laughs> He's doing security stuff. Secure metrics. Oh. But that, again, that's up in the air. I think that will come out of a lot of this API discussion that we have. And each one, I think, is going to have their own place to have those full blown. I'm, I'm still thinking of recording and the capabilities of the recording engine. Mm -hmm. so, either get in the way of doing certain things or enable it from, you know, yeah. so. It's actually, I'm less concerned about recording and I'm more concerned about automating because that's where people want to leverage the data after the fact. You know, so like you have the data, now I want to like really yeah. manipulate it, play about, with it. Well, I think that might be tricky. Things that external to this like storage and things where things vary more drastically, mm -hmm. where the associations are hard associations. You know, the report, it's hard for the, because the reporting engine is based on query. So that's an interesting point. We're really focusing on vert and cloud providers. Those two right. sockets. Storage, to me, is a whole entirely separate socket. That, that doesn't probably, even exist right now. It doesn't I mean, even exist. We, we, we and, have the idea of the storage, reporting engine but, is going to be common. Well, the reporting so, engine would go against the database, right? So that's behind, that's at the core side. So when we design that storage piece, um, that has to be taken in consideration for behind the socket. Right, and we're going to go through this same kind of kind of thing with storage. Um, I think we're trying providers first because we know it the most. That's like our bread and butter. Um, we're intimately, so intimately knowledgeable with it that I think we can do it. You know, the way we're thinking, we can do it and see where it happens, see what happens with it. And if it works, then we can say, hey, we can apply this pattern to storage or even new right. stuff, containers. I guess what I'm getting at is you may want to think about extracting the reporting engine from your database access if that's possible? It's tough, but we can try. The, that goes back to the, the original slide where I was mentioning services. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'd have to do that with the reporting engine anyway if we wanted to say to someone, you can replace this with a different reporting engine. So there's going to have to be that layer of abstraction. Or we'll go through model associations instead of right. right, right. Well, I mean, that's, that's the whole thing behind reporting. It's easier to write reporting to go against SQL. Mm -hmm. But anytime you go against SQL, now you just solidified SQL and you right. can't change SQL. Right. Right. Versus the model, at least that's nice. But I was trying to say uh, something that is group, we've been uh, kind of making fun of the fact that we make every provider look like VMware, which you could also poke fun as every virtual provider just looks like EC2, right? But I mean, it's, it's at least a common framework. And it does, there is something to be said for normalization. Uh, not, not, normalization, I mean, yes. Not going overboard, right. but there is something to be said for The problem is we normalized the wrong way, right? Possibly. So we took cloud and we jammed it into infra. 
And they're really two completely separate things. Okay. We took Rev and we jammed it into VMware. Instead of coming up with an abstraction for both, yeah. we said, you fit into this guy. Mm -hmm. That's not an abstraction, that's a redirection, <laughs> right? Um, it's it, yeah, it's, it's Abby Norman. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Um, granted, the owner is the 800 pound gorilla. Um, so we probably want to let them have like, you know, 80% of the influence, you know, in the design right now. But um, I think we've made decisions, especially on the metric side, that are just are killing us. Uh, and ultimately, we want to get away from that. So. so <laughs> yeah, just use Delta Cloud. It's fine. Um, so yeah, we've also talked about, I think it came up this morning, this idea of registering providers. So once you've created a provider, how, how does it even, how does it become part of the application? Um, we, gotta, we don't know. Like, we got to figure that out. Um, and is there going to be things like callbacks where, I mean, one, so one, I don't know if the callbacks is the right term, but one idea that we were kind of talking about was like, okay, so today when we get events, we get the raw event information from the provider, and we just kind of stuff that into the database. But then, you know, th sprinkled throughout the, the application, we have ways to tease information out of that, to say, what's the source VM for that raw event? And we just happen to know to, how to dig through it and find the source VM information. Um, it would be really nice if you just hand that raw event over to some provider library and say, you tell me what a source VM is out of this, and you tell me what the source host is. I don't want to have to know how to do that. Um, so little things where we can kind of get information that we may store, but hand it over to the provider and have them give it back to us. Um, and then we've already talked about Rails engines to death. Um, problems? So, See how getting us face. Um, that's a problem. So UI, we know UI is a problem. Um, this is this is you know we've already discussed it. It's going to be hard to pull things out of the UI to make them um, less provider specific. I, I want to give one quick example to this to the UI piece. Um, when you when you set up a, pro, a new provider and you want to create the authentication page where you actually go in and enter credentials and everything in the controller. This, and, and as far as I know, this is the only place in the application where this information is known. In the controller, it has logic in there to say, if you're OpenStack, then you should show the default credential information and AMQP credential information. So even though we should know that somewhere else, maybe in the model or something, it's this one chunk of logic in the controller that knows that and it knows that Rev has default and metrics, and it knows that uh, VMware has seven things. I don't know how many. There's like three or four different things that you can, three or four different types of authentication information that we can collect for VMware. Um, this one controller is the one that owns all this information. So it's going to be a little tricky to pull that out and make it live somewhere else and make it behave a little bit. Nicely. Um, talked about server roles this morning. I'm really glad you did. Um, so we have this one file called something like MIQ classes, something or other, mm -hmm. that has the list of all of the workers in it, in order, in a specific order. What order should you start? What order should you be killed in? Um, and the provider specific workers are in this list. Of course, this is buried somewhere in the application. So, this we have this list of server roles, or you know, it could, we have this list of workers that can tie back to server roles to say when you have this server role, you start these workers. And we need to find a way, I don't know how, to start ripping those out of this list, throw them somewhere else, and say that these workers can be registered somehow and the Maybe priority? Yeah, and then have some kind of I need to be for this guy? Right, I, and, and we don't, you know, and how would you know who the other guy is? Like, you don't know if there's another provider maybe you depend on, maybe it's storage in, in cloud. So maybe you need the storage stuff running before you have cloud stuff running, but you don't know. You don't know if there's another storage thing there. So there's some questions we just don't have the answers for yet. Yeah, I think the things like the kill list is, the kill list came about because we, we know certain operations 
will react better to being killed. So if we run out of memory on a box and we need to start like shutting down workers, well, which one do you pick first? Do you pick the cap and you worker or do you pick the inventory worker? But we need inventory for other stuff, so maybe cap and you can go down because other boxes can run it. These are like logical decisions that I'm not sure you can make at a provider level. Um, but the core would have to know intimately about the providers. So there's yeah. a bit of a, a knowledge overlap that makes teasing that apart kind of difficult. Um, Rails models are going to be a problem. We talked about, you know, possible solution being Rails engines, but we have provider-specific models living with our models. Um, if we pull those out and put them somewhere else, we have an entire class hierarchy. We've got to worry about STI. We've got to, how, did, how does that come back into play? If you have, if you pick up one of those subclasses and throw it off somewhere else, <laughs> and that subclass may even be in the middle of some inheritance structure. <laughs> how do you then tie that back? I mean, there's, there's, there's things we have to figure out how to, how to pull those out and, and move them off. Is that doable in a Rails engine? Can you have a model that subclass Can you? from a base class in another model yeah. in another engine? I was told yes. Yeah, yeah you can. Well, it's an, an engine's an engine. It's just it's a convention of bringing class in. I mean, it's not so. Right. What would have to happen is things I don't know like that the VM model way. would have to exist in the core and <coughs> for the plug-in to right. depend it's a, it's on. A so it becomes a dependency and a, a sort of an API, maybe. Um, you know, maybe it provides some core methods that then can be overridden in the in the provider specific. I mean, model. if you want if you want to provide this really true plug-and-play of any combination or even standalone right. providers or whatever else, mm -hmm. then, you know, it's, I, if there's a hard dependency, then you have to be able to define that. You have to define it, and you have to find a clear separation <laughs> between the two. Um, we touched on fleecing. Just, it's a thing we do, and we have not thought about it at all when it comes to separating providers out. Um, Really? <laughs> so awesome. Any awards when his time is up? Yeah. No. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah, Thanks for the award. Um, so fleecing is, a, is yeah, I mean, you know, we. Th that's a that's a major function of the application. It's okay, I thought about it. Yeah, you know, Rich has it solved. <laughs> I should just put, you know, and maybe as simple see as, Rich. It, as you have to, a provider has to provide an API to get bits. Right. It may be you have to provide access to the storage. We don't really know what the better kind of delineation line is. The problem is the variation in that is large. Could be large, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So we talked about this a little bit, so jam inclusion. So again, if we're using engines, maybe that's the answer. The engine just says, hey, I also need this gem. Um, case in point, OpenStack is the only provider that we care about or that we use fog for. So if, we got, if, if OpenStack didn't exist in our application, we also wouldn't have fog. So if, it, if we ripped it out and moved it aside, it wouldn't exist in our application and we wouldn't require fog. It would require fog and it would tell us, hey, fog needs to be there. Yeah, and then out of that comes dependency, potential dependency problems. If you have one provider that depends on fog version X and another provider that on fog version Y, yeah. And you want to put them together, you may not be able to. So, uh, yeah, we haven't really figured that one out. <laughs> but that's that's gem specs in general. Maybe, yeah. You know, it depends. I mean, may, maybe that maybe that's, maybe a, that's a community. Problem. Maybe that's a community um, coordination thing. You know, where do where does Manage IQ core fit in with that? We don't know. I mean, we've had that problem with gems that depended on other gems. Right. You know. And then and there's what if the core depends on a gem? You know that that's going to set the set the bar. So um, and it, it it goes beyond gems. It goes to versions. It goes to well, things so like Ruby. You know, yeah. if we want to upgrade core Ruby core core to Ruby two two, right? Every other guy got to come into place because they're going to run in the same location. So that's going to be a little tricky if you're managing, you know, all of that in the future. So versioning is really about like if if we start creating. If we start creating APIs for plugins to plug into, I mean, everybody knows API versions are always messy, right? I mean, you do, it, it, it's, it's tough to manage API versions. Um, some people have it figured out, I guess, but every, everything I've ever worked on that has an API. What's that? Semper. <laughs> but like, now you've got to worry about, is, is it backwards compatible? Right. Like, once you move on, 
you know, your, your first version is kind of an oops version, right? You, you, you wrote it, you wrote the API, it's like, yeah, we did a lot of things wrong, so let's write the next version, but now you've got to, do you keep it backwards compatible? Do you keep a bunch of code around to allow those old API plugin pieces to still on work? Sources of those pieces, right? right. Exactly. If, it, if it's just us, then we, we can just rewrite them and move them forward. If it's not just us, and that's where the whole plugin thing comes in, where we enable the community to write plugins, we don't want to necessarily have to go back to the community and say, hey, by the way, uh, write it again. Can you rewrite that one? I mean, <laughs> I really like the fact that you wrote this. Can you do it again? Um, and, and I mean, that's just, that's not great. You want to be able to support the one that was written. And then, you know, maybe at some point in time, start pushing it forward. But, um, and then, sure, there's going to be more problems. Do the, do the different providers... Hey, good timing. <laughs> do the different providers have to be models? Do they have to be subclasses? Do they actually care about the persistence? Or will they be declaring their own relationships in that model? They don't it's, necessarily have to be. Right. I mean, we could go to just being a property on the model, if it needs that. Um, right now it's STI, so in the short term, I know we need to we need to maintain that because there's a lot of code that depends on that. Like it'll say, "Am I a kind of VM?" But it doesn't care about the subclass bits, right? Um, if we start breaking out, you know, certain provider-specific things, I, I don't know how that would work. It would end up being just giant if case, you know, if it's VM or this or this or this or this. You know, the, the cases, the places where we use subclassing to actually figure out the tree. Um, I, I, don't know. It, it, I mean, it's possible in some of those cases that the provider-specific business logic is just a declaration on the model, right? The model exists. It can talk to the database. It knows how to do that. Um, it has all the fields. STI be damned, right? I mean, all the fields are still there. Um, and then all the provider-specific stuff might just be operations that happen on the provider. So it says, I'm a VM, but I also know how to stop myself, which means go talk to a provider and stop the VM. And the, the registration process may be... I think that's the whole reason why it was subclass to begin with, it because we combine operations with the database columns. Yeah. Um, and I really think that they can be completely teased apart. Yeah, potentially, I, I can picture there just being a VM model that has a stop. And the registration of a stop would tie that method to some back end, to some class somewhere like VM VMware operations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the standard VM class stop would be not uh, implemented. Yeah. Right, it'd just be a stub or a, an abstract class. If you what would. I was thinking is, I mean, it's basically, we basically just have a strategy pattern, right? Yeah. Like we're just configuring yeah. those. We're basically using STI in place of a strategy. We could mm -hmm. just store in the database like, okay, for this particular one, it would be exactly the same. It's essentially the yeah. type column. Yeah. yeah, we just say take that type <coughs> column, use that type column to go look up the, the actual the provider thing yeah. and yeah. then go grab that thing. Exactly. And then use that as your strategy. Yeah, to and, stop then, and then anybody that wants to implement their own, they don't even need to know about Rails. Right? They don't need yeah. to know about Active Record. Right. Yeah. Ideally, that would be what we want to get to. Yeah. Initially, well, again, just teasing it apart, uh, I think uh, first step, we got to we got to keep it for a little while, uh, but ultimately, ultimately, I'd like to get there where you just see a VM and you don't really care. But there still needs to be that metadata for things like automate methods that people write. They need to know what kind of VM is this or um, that type field that you're talking about. Yeah. So. Well, we, we well we can, you can still ask the model and say, "Hey, what type? What type? Are you? What type are you?" Yeah, and exactly. It'll, go look, it'll just look that up from the strategy exactly. based on the strategy. Yep. I mean, I, I heard that the. Um, like the VMware, we have a lot of the start and stop logic kind of built. Yeah. But it sounds like OpenStack or some of these others, we, we, we did a better job of teasing, teasing that apart. So we kind We're of... Not even teasing it apart. We never did it in the first place. Okay. Yeah. So, so we, we just knew ahead of time that we shouldn't do it this way. So we just <laughs> wrote it that We started way. to write it, but VMware was already there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. So, so at least in OpenStack, it seems like we have this state-centric pieces and the non-state-centric pieces. Yeah, I mean, not 100%, but right. yes. Sounds good. Um, what percentage of this plugin that somebody were to write for, for the existing providers, I won't even speculate for the future, what percentage of this stuff it can be non-state centric versus which percentage of it is state centric? I, I think that was, I think it was, it was very similar. Basically the same, yeah, I, I, I mean. I think a lot. I, think I, we're, I, I really, hope a lot, I the, hope a lot. Yeah. The really tricky part I think will be some of the worker management that we do. Um, where we spin up specific workers for specific types of things. Yeah. And those workers have specific 
Um, we're, we're only one instance of that, so we saw the solve one, one instance. Which refresh? We have refresh, we have events, we have cap and you. Well, not cap and you. Yeah, but those are all generic, but you don't, you don't have workers for OpenStack events versus. No, you do. No, you events. do. That's you have, you have, you have OpenStack out. event catcher and you have um, OpenStack event refresh. Event. Yeah. Workers. We do have that. I don't know how thick. But I think I, think I don't know. I don't know how thin or thick that is. Um, we've started researching into you know seventy thousand lines of code. Yes. Yeah. So so we don't really know what percentage of this is really model centric and what's not model centric. Right. Yeah. And I, I I think I think this first step. Start moving it away. Start putting it off into its own its own space. Directory, yeah. Put its own petri dish. Yeah. And let's figure out spaghetti in a petri dish. Very let's cool. figure out how we can like look at those things and say, okay, what pieces of this can kind of be pushed back into the core that are state specific things or a shared or something. Yeah, or, or you know, is is this a shared thing? But if we get to that first point and say all OpenStack stuff lives in this OpenStack area over here, kind of quarantined by itself, um, and that may inadvertently pull some things we didn't want in there, like state, saving things in the database, that, that may happen, first step, but then we can took, take another look at it and say, okay, well, that was that was first step. Let's put some of the state stuff back over here in core, and let's keep some of the business logic over here in the provider. I think my expectation of just moving it around will uh, reveal that number that you're looking for, right? So we don't really know right now. So we think, okay, we know there's certain pieces are obvious. Like, oh, we can take that and just move it over here. So we start moving all that out of the way, and now we see what's left, and we can kind of figure out a better approach to perhaps tearing those apart. Right now, there's just so much kind of overlapped all over the place that we can't see the forest for the trees. Um, so state, again, step one, get it out of the way so we can actually look at the actual problem and figure out some of these other questions. So do you guys have a proposal for kind of what what a bucket would look like? A pot, whatever you Yeah, I think it was yeah, the, that. Oh, you went so fast like this. Blazing. Yeah, how's the video? Oh. Yeah, no, so that's, that's two. That's what? Two there we go. So, so what? what? Yeah, I understand that. Okay, so let me click down from there. Kind of no, we don't know. That's what we're trying to say. Is we don't know what the API will look like because we don't even know what the code looks. Like. Oh, okay. I mean, so right now, um, with like uh, the event side, right? Take all the event capture pieces and right. events, but not the event handler. Because uh -huh. event handler is more core, gotcha. right? Um, with metrics, it could be uh, the piece that goes out and actually uh, asks for metrics. Like, which right now lives right beside the piece that knows how to then deal with metrics. Mm. So we got that's something we actually have to pull apart inside of a file. Where in some cases we can just pick up a single file and move it move and say, it place. Yeah. get it out of the way. It's it's like, like, the, like the event catcher is its own thing for each so, provider, just move it. And so the idea that you know, inside the MDB we're going to have a provider's directory or something? It, well, or right, so initially under, under, under lib. Under lib. lib. It would live in lib initially. VMDB lib? No, lib. No, lib. Main lib. root lib. Slash lib. Lib provider. <laughs> that that picture. <clears throat> yeah, you were on that. Like, it goes faster here than it was there. You're so oh, close. Is it anywhere? So there it is. I lost that one. I jumped over. Lib providers. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. you would. You right know, now. You were here. Um, it can always be moved. Right? So we're, this is the initial kind of bucket layout that we're looking at. And the reason it's going to live is ideally this would become a gem. And one of the things we talked about was gemify all of lib. Um, so that's where we want to get to. But is any real specific code in there as well? Or is it Not yet. Uh, initially, it would just, so initially we just, first step, just move files around. You know, move so our base. Second step would be finding things that are probably, like say the VMware operations, right? We'd make a class on how to handle VMware operations put them in an operations subdirectory, and then change the models to just call out to that operation well, object. Right? Well, <laughs> Step two, that teases those apart. Right? Well, let's deal with it. Then we can look, start looking at Rails engines for saying, OK, I need this STI thing. Or maybe we get rid of STI altogether. But we won't know that until we get there. But, but in the past, we said, if, if there's any Rails specifics mm -hmm. that's going to go under the MDB, right. things that we really have no ties to Rails whatsoever. Correct. And ideally, that's what we keep. Right. right? We want that. So yep. there would be no model things that are Initially, yes, hopefully. We don't know what the future is. That's the whole point of the question marks at the end. It's like, 
we can't make that declaration now and say we're never going to put via, like model stuff in there because we don't know if it's going to go in there. Right. Initially, we want to say we're not. Initially, we don't want to do that, right? We want to kind of create, uh, encapsulate objects that provide the features that are needed by the model. Kind of strip it down, the models down to their core, and then see if we even need to put models in there. Because um, we may not need STI, we may not need models, we may not need engines. You know, it may fall out that we don't need these things because we've structured it properly. Why haven't we done this yet? It's 70,000 lines in that giant number. I don't know, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's okay. So, no, 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 so, no, I can, I can, I can add Microsoft SE. No, 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 you cannot. I can split everything apart. <laughs> what, can, let, let me what are our question. next steps and what can we do here? What are our concerns as we move forward? You okay, know, so yeah. the concerns are there's two people that work on providers today. Okay. There's myself and Brona. Yeah. And that's it. And, and, and you get swamped. Mm -hmm. And we all get swamped. <laughs> and so, right now, there's two people that can actually take on that work and we well, just have to with you. I mean, that, that, this is why it's not happening. Like, I mean, this is this is a real commit. I mean, I, I did it. I did a commit, um, and I pushed it. Um, so, I mean, I, I am. It it a has a number. <laughs> it's a number. <laughs> so he's committed. I'm committed to this. So, I mean, so I've I've pushed things up there. Things actually live in a place, and yeah, I have a fix-up push too. Yay! That should be rebased. Um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, things are happening, but like when I get five minutes, right? Five minutes, I'm gonna go move the thing. Okay, go fight a fire. Five minutes, go move another thing. Um, this is what's happening right now. Yes, I think the, one of the things we want to get out of this is to kind of set up the basic directories framework, get something in place, so potentially more people could help move these things. So the thought is OpenStack is in the reasonable, I mean, at least it sounded like it had a little bit of the model to use to put in the library. Mm -hmm. So the thought is, if we that will be the least expensive to move over to providers, and then that can be a blueprint for it. So it's yeah. I think one of the smallest footprints we have out of everything. So that's why we're going to focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, like, like even Rev has hosts, and OpenStack has an host, right? Because it's purely cloud. Right. We, we all the cloud stuff. We ignore the fact that OpenStack has So hosts. it's a little easier to tease out, let's say, cloud networks than it is hosts. <laughs> um, More questions? Cool. I, I have a question. Ah, oh, so close. <laughs> <laughs> Another one of the challenges, um, the reason that we haven't done this for years is that, in my mind, um, for example, you're sitting on a VM model object in an active record and you want to do a stop. Um, you, you kind of have to start traversing this relationship to find this provider. And then it's credential or whatever, so it can make a connection. Sometimes it might be to know what host it's on or something like that because we need to send a host operation. Is there kind of any outline of, of what that might look like or what it could look like? Or? So, one of the things we talked about was the um, separation of a cloud provider and a bird provider. Mm -hmm. um, and at the API layer, those things we know about the general kind of connections between them. Um, so hopefully creating a pure separate, that's why we stuck the cloud directory in here, um, was to say that this is going to kind of focus on the cloud API, if you will, for the for this particular provider. Um, you know, replace cloud with anything in the future, like not just vert, that might be storage, just, you know, yeah. be another subdirectory. Um, I think, so I think part of the, okay, so there's going to be some things that happen inside of a provider that need to be linked together, right? So that's, that's part of, I think, part of your question, right? So a VM gets stopped and maybe something else inside the provider has to be notified or something has to happen. And today, we may issue that call. We may say, stop the VM and I know because you're VMware and you stop a VM, you also have to do another thing or whatever. That's a completely contrived example. It's not even that. It's, it's what information do I need to send in to the provider object over here? I should be able to I should be able to tell a VM stop with this ID and yeah well like here, here's here, here's a VM object 
I'm I should the record should. side, yeah, but, but then how do you translate that into I'm going to create a provider object and send in this VM and That's do a stop? Part of, part of what we've got to figure out. Well, but there's also, actually an abstraction that does that already. Yeah, the there, there is. I mean, that that's the that's, that's a concern, well, right? Well, there's, there's, we include there, that concern and then... You know, there's, there's MIQ Vim VM, right? And then there's MIQ VM, which is an abstraction mm -hmm. on top of that. But once you get an MIQ Vim VM thing, you could do VMware operations on whatever that VM represents. Right. I don't think we use it. No. We do operations. Right. We do, we do use it. No. Uh, for VMware operations, I think we do. But for other ones, other ones we don't. Right? We don't have a, a v MIQ VM object that represents OpenStack, for example. We do, but only for, it's a fake one, only for fleece. Okay, bad example. Yeah. Uh, Amazon. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying yeah, like, conceptually yeah. that. We may want to um, kind of follow that. We may. Uh, that may be our API. That may become the API. Um, okay. Yeah. So, I... <laughs> Is that it? Yeah, I'll find, I'll find uh, that's the reason we don't know. <laughs> Any other questions? Ooh. Cut, Eric. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll clap for myself.